Since we accepted the modern Gregorian calendar in 1752, the people of the world began celebrating New Year's Day on January 1st. So that means that New Year's Day is the closest thing that we have to a global celebration. In a time where everywhere people are reviewing the past and setting goals for their future. Now in ancient times, people looked to the Roman god Janus. Janus was the god of new beginnings and of uh, transitions and of gates and doorways and of endings and of time. Sculptures of Janus show a god with two heads, one looking backwards into the past and one looking forwards into the future. The January and the concept of janitor come from the god Janus, but a two-faced Roman god is not going to be of any help to us. As Christians, we celebrate the new year and we look for our new beginnings in Christ. <coughs> Now for some of you, maybe everything's going well. Your days are safely measured with common activities and tasks to be ticked off. So your New Year's resolutions may be just some kind of small improvement or adjustment in your life, like I'm going to lose 10 pounds or exercise a few more times this week. Others are facing the year hoping for life renewal, a do-over, a new beginning, a completely fresh start, a chance to wipe the slate clean and go forward. They're not going to be able to do this alone. In fact, those of us who just want to lose 10 pounds aren't going to be able to do it alone either. We are all going to need a mighty God, a powerful God, a God that can make all things new. And that's what this season of Epiphany is all about. The public revealing of the might of God in Jesus. In Advent, we already heard angelic pronunciations to Joseph and Mary, which remind us that of Jesus' divinity is revealed to ordinary men and women. There are no gender boundaries. And we've had the witness of the shepherds on Christmas night. People struggling from the very edges of life came and saw Jesus' divinity and then went out and taught about it. And so we know that there's no economic boundaries or social status requirements for feeling and seeing the divinity of Christ. And then today in our first lesson, Matthew broadens the scope of Jesus' missions to include the Gentiles, we non-Jewish seekers, by having the Persian priests that we call the wise men come and give gifts to Jesus and honor the divinity of the baby. And so we know that there's no religious fences barricading us from Jesus' divinity. And the story Luke gives us about Simeon and Anna show us that when we seek God's salvation, we will find it, and that Jesus is our divine salvation. Luke says that Simeon was a righteous and devout man who had spent his life looking for the consolation of Israel. So he's saying that Simeon was waiting to see the one who would fulfill those Jewish messianic promises. Luke says that Simeon was guided by the Spirit, and so he was. It was the human spirit who told him to go to that temple at that time, at that day, at that place. There are 35 acres of buildings and courtyards in the temple of Jerusalem, and yet he found the holy family. <coughs> He looked into the baby's eyes and saw the divinity of Jesus and burst into prayer and praise for God, saying, God, now you can release your servant. Release me in peace as you promised. With my own eyes I've seen your salvation. It is open now for everyone to see. 
a God revealing light to the non-Jewish nations and glory for your people of Israel. He has waited so many years to see God's anointed one. Now he can die in peace because he's recognized God's salvation plan for all in Jesus. God also tells us about Anna, a very old and wise prophet who spent her days fasting and praying at the church, at the temple. She too sees Jesus, God in Jesus, and tells everyone else who's seeking salvation. Already within the first months of Jesus' life, people can look at him, look into his eyes, and know that he is divine, the Son of God. The rest of the Bible is given to us to teach us about the fullness of Jesus' life, about the truths in his parables, about the powers of his healings, about the ethics of what he died for, and about the mighty force to bring new life as shown in his resurrection. We need this divine power. We need this forgiveness. We need to ground our resolutions. In fact, we need to ground our whole life in Christ as we prepare to meet this new year. We need Jesus' divinity, but we also need his humanity. A remote skybound God can't help us much as the one who has felt the pain of aching bones, or that gnarl of hunger, or the break of a, the hurt of a broken heart, or that constant itchiness of dissatisfaction. Luke's story shows us the humanity of Jesus, too. His parents brought their baby boy to a temple following their customs, as set out in the book of Leviticus. For the consecration of a newborn and the purification of the mother, Jesus is nurtured in a humble family, one that can only afford two small birds for a sacrifice, not the lamb that would be required of wealthier people. Jesus, who's going to redeem the whole world, is at this time himself redeemed, just as any other Jewish child would be. A God who lives with us, who has experienced all the aspects of human life, from the chill of a manger, to the joys of childhood, to the discernment of God's call, and eventually to the separation of death, can be most helpful in guiding us. My seminary friend David Hosey expresses it this way in a poem. My God could only be one with scars on his arms and tears in her eyes, could only be one for whom fear, loneliness, and love were not pl platonic abstracts, but living, breathing, fleshy, and real. Invent a God for me. Gather all the normal, noble attributes of all the noblest people in the world and multiply them a hundredfold and I will still give my homage to a God with tears in his eyes and scars on her arms. Even though we have a God that is fully divine and fully human, not everyone will allow themselves to be guided by Jesus. Listen to Simeon's words from Mary. This child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel to be a sign that will be spoken against, so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your own soul too. Jesus will be intolerable to the established authorities. He will offend prejudice. He challenges conventions. He sets standards of right and wrong. He ignores some of the best people and champions the common crowd. 
One commentary reminds us that Jesus comes not only with a child's appeal, but with the everlasting man's authority to force us to decisions that are difficult, to compel us to review and reshape the values of our living. So here we are on New Year's Day, reviewing and reshaping the values of our living. And some of us are ready for that change, hoping for that change, looking for a fresh start. Will you trust your unknown future to a known God, one that's fully human and fully divine? Or are you one of those people that is already comfortable and hasn't considered making changes? Will you consider becoming uncomfortable for a closer relationship with God? Would you be willing to come to a Bible study or our upcoming TV dinners? Would you rest, risk stepping out of your comfort zone to help the homeless in January? Will you give up a Saturday and come to a training event to improve your leadership skills? Like the sign outside our church says this morning, will you let your resolution be his solution? Amen.